Um, doesn't get better, mate, does it? Um, we just keep having these monumental moments on the electronic cafe. And, you know, when we sat in my lounge three years ago, three and a half years ago, <laughs> someone walked up and said, yeah, you're going to meet Martin Ware, Neil Wolf, uh, Andy McCluskey and many others. Oh, and Vince Clark. We would have thought they need locking up. But I mean, Vince Clark is a true synth pop royalty. You know, Depeche Mode, yeah. Yazoo, Erasure. I mean, it's fair to say that we've spoken to, to a lot of people over the last few years and me and you were both nervous before this one. You've got to admit that. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Um, and thankfully, like everyone else we've met, we needn't be because Vince was just so accommodating um he's quite dry but in a nice way i think you know he's got he's got he's a quite he's obviously incredibly intelligent um and uh i thought it was brilliant absolutely brilliant i mean the thing is his solo album is amazing i'm you know i'm not just saying that because you know, when you read the premise of like the solo album he set himself parameters it was only going to be using one note and it was only going to be using euro rack you could think, oh, it could be self-indulgent or it could be, you know, not the type of electronic album that we would listen to, but I genuinely love it. It's a remarkable piece of work. I think you nailed it just then. Like, when you hear, oh, it's one note, it's drone, you think, but the texture and sounds that he gets from one note on each track is incredible. Um, so it was a real pinch yourself moment. And yeah. should we dive in? Let everybody else... I think, yeah, if you want to... See us talking to Vince, not us two talking. So uh, let's let them see see what we're, we're so excited about still. <laughs> enjoy. So, so enjoy it. Vince Clark on the Electronic Cafe. Yeah, I'll see you when you're older. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, mate. Good, mate. See you when you're older. This is a mega legend pinch ourselves episode electronic cafe. We're delighted to meet one of our biggest music heroes, Mr. Vince Clark. Welcome to Electronic Cafe, uh, my friend. Congrats on um, Songs of Science. We cannot stop playing it. it and genuinely cannot stop playing it. Uh, I was playing it this morning. It's a great piece of work. You must be delighted with it. Yeah, I, I'm 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 really pleased with the way it, it turned out. You know, it was it, it was never really um when I started doing it it was never really intended as, as an album in fact you know it was um it was more me experimenting in the studio with sound yeah. just it wasn't until i spoke with the record company that, that, that we decided that perhaps it could become an album mm. but yeah i'm pleased with the, with the, i'm pleased at the way it's turned out and it seems to you know it seems that some people quite like it as well as me <laughs> <laughs> we um we saw you a couple of weeks ago at the LSE in London. I think it was the day the album was released. And we hadn't heard the album until that night. It was the first time that we heard it. And we was genuinely blown away. And me and Andy was just like, before you joined us a few moments ago, we were just talking. And just walking through London or sitting on the train, it's so cinematic. Like the music kind of fits the world going on around you. It's just, it's just yeah. such... It's such a beautiful record. I genuinely love it. And I used to be, you know, I was in a band. I used to be synthesizers and samplers, and that was that was my thing. And for me, just the subtones that come in and just everything about it. I mean, your pop sensibilities shine through because it's not it's not your usual ambient album because the songs are four minutes, five minutes, 
maximum yeah. length. They don't go on for, for 20 minute pieces, but it's got some interesting things that come and go through the song. I mean, it's a really impressive album. I love it. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was, the, it was, that was quite cool because I started getting interested in this time, in this genre. Yeah. Maybe two or three years ago, because a friend and I were doing a radio show, uh, a local radio show. We had like a, we were playing, you know, it was called the Synthesizer Show. And we were playing. Was that with Rage? That was with Rage, yeah. And um, we, you know, after the, after we ran out of Gary Newman remixes, <laughs> <laughs> where we, started, we had to, sort of, I started looking into, uh, you know, new electronic music. And it and I and I definitely noticed that um, with electronic ambient experimental music, things have really changed and moved on. Yeah, and so that's really that's the thing that attracted me to doing something like this, to something in this vein. I mean, you know, maybe twenty years ago, I would have said, well, you know, ambient music is at least the sound of whales singing. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you and, uh, that. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's definitely um, it evolved since yeah. then, I think. Um, hence um, the style of this, this my own record. Yeah, it's, it's great. And as you say, it's very cinematic. And, and... I think was it was it Daniel Miller that so sort because of, I think when we saw you talking to Rough Trade, it's kind of him that convinced you as well as a few other people to release it as an album, right? Yeah, I mean, what I mean, as I say, I mean, I was I wasn't intending it to be an album. It was for my own sanity yeah. making it, and I, I you know, I, I speak to Daniel regularly, and um, he just said, "What are you up to?" And I said, oh, "I'll be messing about with this and that," and that. and he said, "Send me some stuff," and then he then he got back to me and said, "Maybe we could make it into a record." As Mark said, you know, it's very textured and layered. And I love that track, you know, with, with, with Car- is Caroline Joy, the opera singer. How, how did you yeah. find her? Because, you know, when you put, when we just like Mark said, when we saw you and she came on and we heard it, I was like, wow. You know, so is it something you knew from the past you happened to find? I mean, how did that collaboration happen? Well, it was interesting. I mean, I, the, the, you know, making these tracks took me a long, long time. I had to, you know, I was listening really, it doesn't really make much sense, but I was listening really hard. And uh, on that particular track, which is called Passage, I, I, I created the, the, the track, and then I just had this idea of something much, something organic, to be on top of what I'd created already. And I'd been listening to a little bit of opera. I mean, I'm not a huge opera fan or anything, but um, I'd been listening to a little bit, and I yeah. thought maybe I could fit that kind of operatic tone onto this track. And it just seemed to work, you know. But I kind oh, of, I almost, I almost heard it in not in my dreams exactly, but I, I could feel it that it would work, and it, it yeah. kind of, mm. yeah. And she, she really cut through the room when she stood out and started singing on your track. I was like, as Mars, I was just like, wow, we're just absolutely fantastic. And, and I know there's not much singing on the whole album, hence the title, I guess, but there's the, the Black Leg track as well, which has got that kind of chant. Yeah. Like a folk song, the old folk song, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, that was, um, that was, I think, I mean, in, in, at least 20 years ago, I was working right. with Martin Ware. We were doing music for art installations. And... Um, we were working quite closely together, and he had he had this. I think it was a cassette of this um, a cappella folk song, which I'd never heard before. Mm. And he said, "Maybe you can do something with this." And I, I, it, I, I, I tried and tried it over and over again to make something of it, but I never could. <laughs> yeah. And then I created this one track, and I just thought to myself, "Well, maybe this will fit over the top of that particular track." 
and I put it there and I didn't tune it, I didn't time stretch it or anything. It just, just sat he's exactly right on that track. And when you get those kind of moments, it's calmer, I think. You set yourself some quite tough parameters when you was recording the album. You set yourself, um, firstly, sounds generated would be solely from the Eurorack system. Yeah. And um, secondly, the tracks would be based around one note. Why did why did you set those parameters or or did you set those parameters to kind of contain you? Because, I mean, a modular synthesis is something you can get carried, all, carried away with. I think both reasons, really. You know, I mean, you know, I have a synth. I have, a, I have, a, I have a, my my studio is like a toy shop, and if you don't set yourself limits, you know, then you're never going to finish anything. <laughs> so, um, and I liked, it, I, you know, I always wondered about this type of music, how people kept it interesting, yeah. and then I started thinking it more in terms of pop music, really. So. Rather than relying on the the traditional, you know, verse, bridge, chorus arrangement, it was more about certain points in the track. An event would happen, even either an event or a change or an evolution would happen, sure. or a certain type of modulation would happen, and that would that hopefully would then keep the listener interested throughout yeah. the, the the length of the track. So, and I didn't want to re rely on all changes to do that it, it was a kind of it was a challenge you know yeah, i bet yeah. i've toyed with um getting getting into modular synthesis like oh you know i used to play synthesizers but it's a rabbit hole that i've always thought i've pulled back from and i just thought it's going to lead me somewhere that's going to be obsessive um you right did you teach yourself how to use it i mean it's quite a complicated piece of kit i mean how did you get into that eurorex system yeah i mean i had i had i had a few bits of modular eurorex gear sitting in my studio and i never really got into it i never really used it much right and when covid happened and i had this you know myself and lots of other people had lots of time that's when i i decided that i would actually um I work out how to use this stuff so you know instead of watching netflix movies i would watch tutorials on oscillator modules modules from pittsburgh wow <laughs> wow i'm well, glad you did mate because it, it's it, it's it's brilliant It's got quite a cinematic sort of feel to it. Have you, have you ever been asked to do a film score? Well, I've done a few little odd projects, you know, yeah. a few short films. But um, I think maybe it was probably 30 years ago, I spent um, a bit of time in L.A. Right. And uh, spoke to lots of film people. And I, I kind of fancied, the, I, I liked the idea of maybe getting in, into that world. But then I realised after all of the meetings I took that, I didn't want to be. I I I I I I, I, I didn't want to make music with someone looking over my shoulder. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, that's um, not a good that, idea. That put me off. Well, yeah. I've, I've just read uh, Stuart Copeland's book, who does a lot of film scores, mm. and it's exactly that. I mean, he he has people sort of like dabbling with him and telling him that that's not got the same right feel for that actor looking at the camera in that way and it's it does seem very restrictive like well to to work in as a musician yeah i mean it's um, i mean and it's understandable i mean if you're a director and you've been, you've spent four or five years trying to finance a film yeah you no know, it's your it's, it's it's that person's vision and that person has probably got a very definitive idea of how they want the film to sound yeah um, yeah and, and, and they, i don't think you know in that world there's not much room for experimentation 
for, for someone like me. Mm. I've got it, got it. And, and, and mate, I'm, now you've done this, I, I know you've got obviously the erasure stuff and everything. Is it something you're going to do? Like uh, probably too early to ask, but a follow up sort of another album of a similar kind of vein or? I, I was, I've been, I mean, I've been thinking about it. I mean, but the next thing that I'll be doing is um, working with Andy. Um, right. Doing, you know, I've got some ideas already, some demos for the next Erasure record. Brilliant. So um, that'll be the first thing. And that's going to hopefully happen, or the writing process will start happening at the beginning of next year. And then after that, who knows? I mean, um, I did enjoy doing this record. I mean, I, it gave me a lot of pleasure. It, it made me feel much calmer. Um, gave me a lot of solace, so I I could I can see I could I can see myself doing something in this vein. But obviously, you don't want to repeat yourself, so you'll know. Maybe I'll have two chords next time around, <laughs> and a small bridge. <laughs> no, the maze, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I know Mark was talking about modular scenes. When we spoke to Martin Ware, he said that you it was you, it was you that bought him a Roland system replacement, uh, uh, Roland one hundred or something. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that's right. I mean, Martin. We were working with Martin for um, one of the Erasure records. He was producing one of our records, and um, it, it was the first time I'd gotten to know Martin. And I was like a huge fan of human sure. you know. So most of our <laughs> most of our Time was spent me asking questions about, well, how did you get that sound? How did you do that? You know, how did you come up with that idea? And then um, he told me, he told me about the the uh, Roland's uh, one hundred, and I, I I I came across one, and I thought, oh, well, that we because he, he said he'd lost his original one or someone had stolen it or something. So I I I said I I I gave it to him as a birthday present. I think mm. he said it was the best present he's ever had. He said there's a knock at the door. And there's all these boxes being delivered, and uh, he couldn't think of believing. <laughs> so um, Daniel Miller told the story where he said he very nearly passed on Depeche Mode because he was he was in rough trade and he and he was a bit in a bad mood, and he very mm. nearly passed on Yazoo because mm. he has he redeemed himself by suggesting to you to release this as an album because it's a. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's. I think uh, he's, I think he's redeemed himself in so much as he's still with still still signed to me. Yeah, you know, it's and it's cool, been, really, I've, known, I've known Daniel for forty two years now. Yeah, and um, you know, and we're still friends. So that's, that's, a lot. Redemption, that's redemption enough, I think. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so Vince, I mean, your your CV is phenomenal. Obviously, Depeche Mode into Yazoo, Erasure, all the people you work with, you know, Jean Michel Jarre and. Is that the reason it's taken 40 years to, to to bring this album out? Have you just been constantly busy? You have been constantly busy, but, I mean, was COVID a part of it and it used that time on your hands and you just thought, I'll do this? Or has there always been a little itching inside you to to release a solo No, no there's never been an itch to make a solo record. In a way, kind of, even when you say solo record, it makes me squirm <laughs> slightly. <laughs> No, I mean, um, no. It was it was really just circumstance, and 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 the, and the way things turned out that this happens to be a record. But um, no, I, I I had no illusions as to be, you know, some kind of solo synth player. <laughs> One of the things we we kind of ask our guests because we Mark and I talk about new bands and also trying to promote new music. Is there anyone new right now that's or you've listened to the last few months has made your ears stand up and go, well, they're quite good, or anyone you're digging right now that we can tell our listeners and viewers about because we love sharing it. It'd be great to hear from you if there's anything that you're loving. 
Well, to be honest, I mean, as I said, when, I, we, were, when we were doing the radio show, we were listening to so much more music, much more yeah. music than I had done for years, you know. Yeah. And love it or loathe it, I mean, I, I Spotify really helped out with that because, you know, you'd, you'd maybe look up one particular band that you like from the past and then yeah. they would list influences or they would list references and then you go down some massive rabbit hole. <laughs> and I yeah. really enjoy I really enjoyed that. Um but there's there wasn't not one particular artist, I wouldn't say, or one particular band. It was more um a feeling of all of this really interesting, exciting, experimental, really, yeah. music yeah. coming out. Yeah. And also I think because I'm older, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a lot older, it was I have got the patience to listen to that style of music. You know, I don't need a massive big here we go, chorus, necessarily. It's funny you say that. Someone puts that on our Facebook page, and I said, I think as you get older, your sonic palette does widen. I really do. And you get yeah. more patient, and you because it's like a fine wine, right? You've got to let it breathe and, and enjoy it. So, yeah, to totally get that. Totally get it. Who are your influences, mate? I mean, obviously, we've heard from the Depeche Mode stuff in the day, but, yeah, who, who are your biggest influences that sort of that made sense to you? I want, this is what I want to do as a career back in the day. I mean, probably well. The first record that was um, that I heard, I thought that well, I had that idea that maybe I could make a, I could do something like that. Was um, the first single from OMD. How oh, really? And the, in, in fact, the B side of Electricity, which is a track called Almost. I love that track. So I heard that track and I thought, and, it, and it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant song, but it's so simple. But at the same time, it's really emotional. Yeah, and it's I, an amazing song. Yeah, and that, that was the first t time I'd heard something very electronic be very emotional. Because up to that point, they've been kind of like Gary Newman, you know, and doing these cold, cold records. And the Kraftwerk, who obviously didn't, never, never smiled. <laughs> but I, I heard almost, and I thought it was almost like listening to a folk song. Yeah, and, I, yeah, and that's another genre that I'm very interested in. Yeah, that's the first support band I ever saw, actually, was OMD, supporting Gary Newman. Gary Newman. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I get it. Yeah, and that track is, 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 is absolutely brilliant. to Andy McCluskey a few weeks ago about the, the new Bauhaus Staircase album and he was he was good fun to chat to. Hey, he was good. hilarious. Yeah, he's in great form. Yeah. Really good form. So Vince, uh, what would be your what would be your Desert Island disc? Well, one, you mean you'll just get the one record. Yeah, I know it's really tough and we always get it wrong because I've got I always get it wrong. It doesn't necessarily have to be one. I mean you can take a yeah a few. I don't know. Probably um there's a, you won't know this one, I don't think, but there's a, a, a record called Songbook by Paul Simon. Yeah. yeah and yeah. it's recorded, isn't it? It's all acoustic guitar. There's no drums, no band, no bass, no nothing. It's just acoustic guitar and singing. Mm. And it's a, it was a prelude, prelude to the Sounds of Silence album, which he then recorded with Vernon Mark Funkel. But all of the songs are killer on, yeah. the, on that and that thing. And obviously, if I had that as a... a Desert Island disc, I'd need to have my acoustic guitar with me so that I could join in. Yeah, see, I'd never have really guessed that, but it's a great shout, really good shout, really good shout. That fortress deep and mighty Platting on me penetrate I have no need of friendship Friendship causes pain It's laughter and it's loving I disdain I am a rock. I am an island. I know you mentioned about the Erasure album you got with Andy again, but um, and I, the, the sort of Martin stuff you did with Martin, the VCMG stuff, that, that was quite cool as well. Is there any, I mean, I'm trying to <laughs> get to be really busy as it is, but is there, is, there, is there an opportunity for that to happen again as well further down the line or? Some new stuff. I'd, I'd like, I'd like, I'd like, I'd like to do it. I mean, that was that was that was really good fun to do. You know, yeah, I, was, um, I just happened to catch Martin at the right. I mean, I, I'm fairly busy, but he's really busy. <laughs> so it just happened. I happened to catch him at a downtime, and he was um, 
you know, able to um, spend some time making and and collaborating on on this that record. Yeah, um, and it was it was it was. It was a good. It, we that that was a process of he and I exchanging files over the internet. You yeah. know, we didn't get together until the very end. Yeah. Um, but it was super enjoyable, and I'm a huge fan. I think Martin's a genius. So obviously, you know, if he if if an opportunity arises and I can I can work with him again, then I'll, I'll, I'll snap it up. That's it. a question is like a real fanboy question but back in the early Depeche Mode days you used to play a song called television set in your set yeah. why didn't that make speak and smell um because I think at that point we'd well we or we we, we learned what, what, what <laughs> publishing was <laughs> All right. and that was now song <laughs> it was that it was a it was a mate from Basildon actually, Jason. I can't remember his surname, but he that was a song that he'd written. So um, we decided love, to do that. Yeah, that explains it. Yeah, I love I love that song, but you made it your song, definitely. <laughs> um, Vince, thank you very much for giving up your time. I mean, as I said to you beforehand, I mean you formed part of our tapestry because growing up in Arminster, we used to see you guys all the time at Crocs and Raquel's and on the train so it's really special for us to speak to you today um and the album i'm not just saying this and Andy's sam not just saying this either we okay. genuinely love this album i mean for for a so-called ambient album each song is just so different and each song is so unique and it's interesting what you said and it's true what you said that you replace like chord changes and choruses with sounds and in introducing things into the song which you know, it keeps the listener, us, really uh, appeal, appeals to us. So it's a fantastic record. We love it. And um, we hope you do another one. Um, there was a song that you gave away with the Electronic Sound magazine, which isn't on the album, isn't it? Yeah, there was um, once the record, because there was, um, it was just an opportunity, really. I mean, um, that magazine has been really supportive. Yeah. And, um, they do this thing where they, I think with every issue, they they, they release a vinyl. Yeah, so um, they, they just asked if I had a track. And I, because there were m many more tracks other than the album, when I, when, when I was putting this stuff together, I, I kind of chose what I thought were the best 10. But there were other tracks and other. So I've, I finished one of the other tracks and that became this 45 for, for that magazine. Yeah, nice, nice. Uh, yeah, you're still doing a lot. Of remixes, mate, because I know you did one for our friends and your tiny magnetic pets, which was fantastic. Um, he's still getting a ton of, I'm sure you're getting a ton of requests, but you've got to find the time. But he's still doing quite a few, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm working on one now. I won't tell you, cool. <laughs> you'd have to kill me if you told me, <laughs> my baby. I love what you did with that tiny magnetic pet track, that was absolutely fantastic, mm -hmm. really fantastic. But as Mark said, mate, really appreciate your time. Um, and, right, thank uh, you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Right. It's been on for us to speak to you and look, we love the album and yeah, we'd love to Brilliant speak to you again at some point. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Vince. Right. Take care, buddy. Yeah, I'll see you when you're older. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, mate. Yeah, mate. See you when you're older.
So that's it for another fabulous episode of Electronic Cafe. What an episode. I mean, you know, to get to uh, meet and chat to the legend that is Vince Clark uh, was a real honour for us both. Vince, thank you for coming on the show. I want to say a big thank you to Zoe for helping uh, set it all up for us. Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, but yeah, absolutely amazing to meet him. I'm so glad that we're bringing these amazing legends to our EC family as we are with new music and new artists. Um, yeah, it's just been an incredible year. Um, I think next year we're looking to do big things as well. We'll let you know what they are. One of them is, of course, our live event, Electronic Cafe Live Volume 2, Club 229, Saturday the 16th of March. What an amazing ensemble of artists we have for your ears. We have the incredible, lovely Peter Dugal. We have the amazing Tiny Magnetic Pets. We have the legend, that is Wolfgang Fleur. Yes, Wolfgang Fleur, ex Grafler, making amazing music in his own right. And if that all wasn't enough, superstar, legendary producer, DJ, artist, musician, all round lovely guy, Mr. Mark Reader will be DJing all the way through till midnight. So what are you waiting for? Get your tickets while you can. It's going to be amazing. Um, that's it for now. We'll see you all in the next episode of the Electronic Cafe. 